Hello, I'm Hazem Sika. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, U.S. stocks hit an all-time high. Is Trumponomics making America great again? Also this week, the Gulf crisis. Could it prove a bigger threat to the global free trade system than a protectionist U.S. or Brexit? Plus, why researchers at Facebook shut down an artificial intelligence that created its own language. At first, there's never been a dull moment in the White House these days. It's now been six months since U.S. President Donald Trump took office, and the word from the president is that there is no chaos in his administration. In the midst of a string of high-profile departures and an ongoing investigation, into his Russia ties, he is trying to divert the world's attention onto the U.S. economy. Just as the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit the 22,000 mark for the first time in its 121-year history, stocks headed higher even as Wall Street lost confidence that Trump's election proposals like tax cuts and infrastructure spending will be pushed through Congress. So what's going on? Well, there's expectations of a loosening of Wall Street rules put in place after the financial crisis. That's given a boost to financial stocks like Goldman Sachs. The second quarter earnings season has also been largely better than expected. In fact, earnings from the likes of Apple have been beating estimates at the highest rate in at least nine years. Things also look positive on the growth front. The U.S. Commerce Department estimates the economy grew at 2.6 percent, an annual rate in the April-June period. But Trump's tax cuts are months behind schedule. The failure of health care reform also raises questions about his ability to get a budget passed. And there's plenty of uncertainty, too, about his trade policies. Well, joining us now from London is Russell Jones. He is a partner at Llewellyn Consulting, an independent economics advisory firm. Thanks very much for being with us. So I know six months is not a particularly long time to uh, assess this, but um, if we look at the U.S. economy uh, at the moment, it does seem to be in pretty good shape. Uh, stock markets are, uh, are hitting uh, record highs, and I know President Trump wants to take credit for that. But how much of that is down to him? Uh, what do you think overall of, of the way he has managed the U.S. economy at this point? I think, in all honesty, the uh, stock market and the economy are, are doing well in the United States in spite of rather than because of uh, what Donald Trump has done. Um, the economy is in, in reasonable shape in, in broad macroeconomic terms. We've got growth, which is around potential. We've got an inflation rate, which is a little bit below target. We've got relatively uh, limited budget and uh, external deficits. So it's, it's in balance. Um, really, what's been encouraging, what's been positive, if you like, is that Mr. Trump has uh, failed to do anything to disturb things. Uh, His policy making thus far has been pretty incoherent, uh, pretty chaotic. He's not really managed to do anything which which could disturb the underlying stability of the economy. And I think that's that's been a good thing. One of the things that uh, uh, Donald Trump has talked about a lot, particularly on the campaign trail, uh, was this whole idea of of getting tougher on on trade, negotiating better trade deals for, for the United States, Uh, he believes, and it gets this whole idea of of economic nationalism and and protectionism. Um, But that goes against years of of Republican orthodoxy, which which favors free trade. What do you think the effects of that will be if if any of that is implemented? Um, I think it's extremely troubling. I mean, thankfully, again, so far, Mr. Trump's rhetoric has gone an awful lot further than the substance of policy. And I think we have to be grateful for that. But what we know from history is that periods of of major restraints on trade have been pretty damaging, uh, not just for the country that imposes those restraints, but for the the global economy more more generally. And if the United States is setting the the, uh, precedent of going down this protectionist route, I think it would be a a very bad sign for for the world economy in future. Uh, One of the things that we've seen as well in looking at the U.S. economy is is the U.S. dollar, which has fallen a a little bit in the last uh, uh, few days. uh, What's the effect of that going to be, perhaps? It's a good thing for exports, isn't it? Yeah, I I think what really troubles me about the dollar at the moment is the sense that it could be losing its role as the world's global currency. Um, that's a pretty, um, pretty outrageous statement, perhaps, but 
the feeling, I think, is that uh, with Trump in the White House, the Pax Americana, if you like, that we've seen since 1945, the sense of the United States leading the free world, I think that's being questioned more and more, perhaps more than at any stage since the late 1970s under the Carter administration. People in the international community are looking at the US, they're looking at the White House, they're looking at policy, they're looking at the incoherence of that policy and saying, well, really, can the US still maintain that position as world leader? And as a result of that, can the dollar retain its position as the global currency? Good to speak with you. It'll be fascinating to see uh, how all of this does uh, turn out. Russell jo Jones joining us there from London. Thank you. Now, U.S. technology firms are at the forefront when it comes to our digital economy. And one of the technologies that many of them are investing in is artificial intelligence. This basically means getting computer programs to do things like translation and decision making, things humans would normally do. Now, this week, we heard how Facebook had to abandon one experiment after two of its robots began talking to each other in their own language. Rob Reynolds reports. I can, can I, I, everything else. Walls have zero to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. It sounds like gibberish, but it's an exact reading of an online dialogue conducted by two chatbots in a Facebook research lab. Researchers designed chatbots that would communicate with one another and engage in negotiations. The bots began communicating in standard English, but then veered off into using English words in non-standard sequences, in effect creating their own private communication code. Researchers eventually reprogrammed the bots to speak standard English, not because they perceived any danger, but because they wanted the bots to be intelligible. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. For what decades, artificial about? intelligence, or AI, has often been depicted in popular culture as menacing. Recently, Tesla and SpaceX founder Elon Musk issued dire warnings about future AI. I have exposure to the very, the very most cutting edge um, AI. Um, uh, and I think people should be really concerned about it. Um, I keep sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like they don't know how to react. Many others in the AI field, including Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, think that image is overwrought to say the least. As for language, scientists have observed for many years that once freed of constraints imposed by programmers, AI creates its own streamlined, more efficient means of communicating, unencumbered by grammar or syntax. While there is scant evidence AI is out to conquer humanity, chatbots, like the ones Facebook developed, are more common than we might imagine. For example, researchers at universities in California and Indiana recently discovered that up to 15% or 47 million Twitter users are bots. Still to come on Counting the Cost, the Prime Minister says the dark days are over, but many Greeks still can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, Qatar's national carrier is expected to get approval for three new international flying routes. That's after a meeting of the International Civil Aviation Organization on Monday. The UN agency discussed the airspace ban imposed by four Arab countries on Qatar two months ago. Daniel Lack reports from Montreal. After what ICAO itself called an extraordinary session of its executive council, the agency said member states must adhere to their obligations under the 1944 Chicago Convention, a treaty governing civil aviation that almost every country has signed. Qatar requested this series of meetings after neighboring countries in Egypt closed their airspace to Qatari flights nearly two months ago. Qatar's transport minister said the ICAO call showed the agency regarded the blockading state's actions as illegal. 
أول شيء تحقق اللي هو. The first thing that was achieved is what we've been asking for, which is that all states should adhere to the Chicago Agreement, which organizes civil aviation. This was our main goal, that all countries should abide by it. The organization insisted on using the word adhere because there is a violation of international safety and security. This is what the international community and the states represented think. Also at the meeting, the blockading states said they would open a number of emergency air corridors through their airspace for Qatari flights. These could ease the difficulties of flying longer routes out of Doha to the north over Iran that has cost Qatar Airways both revenue and passenger traffic. Before the blockade, the airline was reporting record profits and growth of its long-haul network. And officials say that should continue despite the actions of neighboring states. This is one of several steps that Qatar is taking to ease or end the blockade. It's filed a case at the World Trade Organization against the blockading countries, and there's ongoing talks with the International Maritime Organization in London, again aimed at easing the trade blockade, the shipping and air blockade that Qatar has been experiencing since June 5th. Qatar also says it'll return to ICAO after the organization's summer break to press again for a complete lifting of the blockade and to continue with its case that airspace restrictions are dangerous and illegal. So as you just heard there, Qatar filed a wide-ranging legal complaint to the World Trade Organization. It's a way to challenge the trade boycott by Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and the UAE. Well, the WTO is based in Switzerland and operates the global system of trade rules and aims to make trade between countries as free as possible. The WTO has over 160 members representing 98% of world trade. To join the WTO, a government has to bring its economic and trade policies in line with WTO rules and ratify the agreement in parliament. It acts as a forum for negotiating trade agreements and it helps settle trade disputes between its members. Well, joining us now from Jakarta is Hosuk Lee Makiyama. He is the director of the European Center for International Political Economy and a leading author on trade diplomacy. Thanks very much for being with us. So Qatar is taking this to, to the World Trade Organization, um, but what can they do in terms of settling uh, this dispute? Uh, how, how, how will they be deciding on this case and what's the process? There? Before we actually open up for dispute, there will be a number of consultation trying to mediate a problem and before we actually go to a uh, international dispute settlement. But uh, when we look at Qatar's economy over the last uh, few weeks since, since this uh, blockade was, was put in place, uh, imports are down 40% year on year, 38% uh, month to month, so clearly the sanctions are having an effect. What does that mean for, for Qatar's economy and, and what can the World Trade Organization do if trade is down this much? I mean, do they have any, any teeth to, to I enforce this? What the WTO treaties actually mandate is that every country can actually escape their commitment to maintain open trade if they feel that their national security is violated. In this case, this means actually the Saudi Arabia and the three other countries could actually argue that this is a national security matter. And usually, peop uh, well, the, uh, the countries settle their dispute ahead of that, simply because if you claim the national security argument, what will happen is that the entire WTO system collapse. This is rather unprecedented that you make this argument about national security and not even during the US embargo of Cuba or Nicaragua or during the Ukraine crisis involving Russia, uh, the national security extension has been invoked. So there is an, actually a common interest to maintain the WTO system. That means basically that the rest of the world, if they want to keep the WTO system in place, they need to come to Qatar's rescue. Well, let's talk more broadly about the, about the whole trade system because the World Trade Organization is committed to uh, a free trade system. Yet what we're seeing right now with the world's biggest economy uh, being led by a, a protectionist uh, US president right now, we've got um, the UK uh, wanting to leave uh, the European Union uh, with Brexit. Do you think that, that the WTO has, has lost some of its international clout? Is it in danger of, of, of losing it? 
Yes, indeed. I mean, you are right that uh, if you look at the uh, the leading proponent of the WTO system, uh, namely the United States, have basically abdicated as the station manager of the free trade system, if you so like. Uh, the main problem is that there is actually no one else to take its place. The European Union doesn't have the, the clout or the credibility to the lead the WTO. Uh, China does not yet enjoy the trust of other countries and it's still seen as a developing country which is really reluctant to lead. What that basically leaves us is that we have a global trading system is partially at risk but at the same time this is the only rules we have in order to enforce market access and free trade in the various parts of the world, including the United States itself, but as well as main players like China, where President Trump has raised a number of issues. What we can see here uh, in the, the siege of Qatar is that, well, uh, the entire system, which is basically the last line of defense against protectionism, has come at risk. Uh, if this goes to a proper trade dispute that has to be arbitrated, uh, there is a major risk that the other GCC countries will invoke a national security exception, which will give them rights to basically bypass all the WTO, role, WTO rules. And that's even a bigger risk than Donald Trump or Brexit. Good to get your perspective on this. Hosuk Lee Makiyama joining us from Jakarta. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the Greek government say the bad times may be coming to an end, pointing to economic reforms and renewed borrowing as proof that it is behaving responsibly. But the cost of people is growing. Businesses say punitive taxes are making life impossible and punishing those not responsible for the financial crisis in the first place. Here's Lawrence Lee taking a look at the economic troubles from the island of Chios. For hundreds of years, farmers on Chios have cut the barks of mastica trees and watched the sticky resin bleed out. Chios is the only place in the world where mastica gum is successfully collected. So they have a global monopoly. Dozens and dozens of things are made from it. Food, drinks soft and hard, cosmetics, medicinal aids. They sell it all over the world. It's protecting the yeah. And it's a good thing the export markets are growing because at home their sales have tanked. We lost about 30 to 40 percent of our growth, of our corporate growth. Over the last, what, 10 years or so? Yes, yes. Uh, that means that we had, in order to replace uh, this loss, we had to work more and more on exports. Just down the road from the Mastica farm, Iakovos employs five people in the microbrewery he established in 2012. 30% growth every year, his beer selling all over Greece. 100,000 euros. But look at his figures. He and his partner split a profit of 100,000 euros last year. But there's 26% social security, 29% company tax, 6% personal tax, and after all that, 14% advance tax for next year. They're each left with a thousand euros a month because they've paid 75% tax. And for this profit, we have to work seven days per week sometimes. We have to work 12 hours per day. In summertime, we have every day 12 hours per day. So we don't know what to do now. Because for this to change... So you're, you being, have, you're, being, you're being punished for being a successful entrepreneur? Yes. Greece has just returned to the bond markets to borrow more, having apparently proved its financial maturity by raising more and more tax from the people. The Prime Minister says the bad days are over, but very many Greeks say that is the opposite of the truth. Up until around 2005, Greek debt levels were basically stable, running at about 100% of the country's annual income, or GDP. And yet since the crash, and despite everything that Greece has done to try to reassure the financial markets, the debt has gone up and up and up. And it's now almost double Greece's GDP. And all the while, Greeks are being taxed into poverty. A look at the real-time debt mounting is vertigo-inducing. Just as the economy has shrunk, so the owners of Greek debt extract more and more in interest alone. It's like filling a bucket with water 
and watching it drain through the holes in the bottom. The effect is that many companies are closing and starting to work illegally instead. It means they are avoiding tax. It creates unfair competition. In Chios, our small island, many companies have closed and reopened in Bulgaria and Cyprus. The authorities employ tax police to check that shops and businesses issue receipts as proof of sale so they don't avoid paying tax. Those caught risk heavy fines. The old myth about lazy Greeks not paying their taxes has never looked more wrong. The trouble is, it isn't fixing Greece's broken economy. Lawrence Lee, counting the cost, Chios, Greece. Well, joining us via Skype from Athens, Greece, is Philip Ammerman. He is an investment advisor and co-founder of Navigator Consulting Group. Good to have you on the program. So, uh, Greece has returned to the bond market, and according to the Greek government, this is a move uh, initially to test the market. How, how, how do you assess this? Is this a positive sign for, for, for Greece's economy after all these years? Yes, it's definitely a positive sign, not just because the issue was oversubscribed, but I think more importantly because of the fact that the government is using this bond to uh, buy back uh, debt which is, uh, which is due in 2019. So about 1.5 billion of the 3 billion euro bond is used to retire debt early. This is a positive sign. Uh, and the, also the yield was fairly good given the current circumstances uh, where Greece finds itself. If any of this is taken as a sign that Greece's economy has, has turned a corner, uh, that certainly doesn't seem to be the case for, for, for many ordinary Greeks who, who say that um, life is still just as hard, hard as it has been for the last seven or eight years. That's exactly right. I think what we're seeing now is the first indications that the GDP headline numbers are improving, the macro numbers are starting to improve. But in terms of actual family disposable income um, and, and taxes, unfortunately, there's no change. Greece is now turned into a high-tax country with a very low level of public services and with a, uh, a series of like government operations or government control over the economy, which unfortunately is unchanged. So when do you think that might happen then? When, when do you think ordinary, ordinary Greeks will, will, will see any difference here? If we continue at the current rate in which we're seeing, for instance, new investments licensed, new businesses starting, the high level of brain drain, and so on and so forth, I would estimate it's going to take 10 years or more. There has to be a radical change in public policy, and so far that's not forthcoming. All right, Philip Ammerman joining us there from Athens. Good to speak with you. Thank you. Good to speak with you. And finally, like a page from a science fiction novel, a U.S. firm is implanting microchips in its employees. The tiny chips allow them to access offices, computers, and even vending machines. But as Diane Estabrook reports now, some are questioning their security. Microchips, similar to the ones implanted in family pets, are now being embedded under the skin of the employees at a company in River Falls, Wisconsin. In a lot of ways, it was easier than a shot. I mean, I did, everybody's gotten a shot at a doctor. I almost didn't even feel it. At what was described as a chipping party, a professional piercer implanted the radio frequency identification chips into the hands of employees. They're about the size of a grain of rice and will let employees access offices, sign onto computers, and buy snacks from a vending machine, all with the swipe of a hand. More than 50 of the firm's 85 employees were chipped, including Sam Bankston. Well, I knew that there wasn't any weird science or any, anything strange going on with it, um, so I had no problem sticking it in my hands. The company, Three Square Market, partnered with a Swedish-based firm, Biohacks International, to install the technology. President and CEO Todd Westby said the human chips aren't GPS-enabled and are secure. We've got 256-bit encryption, and because it is a closed application, we basically have the keys to the kingdom for anything that gets published on this. Experts say the chips might actually be more advantageous than key codes or access cards like the one I have because this could be stolen. And in fact, Three Square Market says it's already had inquiries from embassies, hospitals, and banks. Still, employee rights attorney Sean Wanta says the chips raise questions with him. He thinks workers could be sacrificing some privacy for convenience. Uh, this card will be linked to vending machines so the employer can see what you're eating when you're eating it. Um, they might be able to see when you use the restroom. 
and piece that information together, an employer can get a pretty good idea of what an employee's workday looks like. The chips can be removed if an employee leaves the firm. The company says it's like having a splinter removed. And while the chips are approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, employee Katie Langer is taking a pass for now. So my concern just is with the health effect. Look, what's going to happen to my body when I'm putting this foreign object into my hand and down the road. Three Square Market says it's investigating other applications for the chips and thinks one day their usage could become as common as smartphones. And that is our show for this week. You can get in touch with us by tweeting me at HazimSeeker and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do or drop us an email counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Hazem Seeker from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.